Hello. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. It's great to see so many people here. Look, I'm Pankaj Sa, I'm the director of the Queensland Brain Institute. And uh, you know, the Broncos in town, I'm sure many of you noticed this. It's a slow way in. So uh, look, welcome to this, the Queensland Brain Institute's public lecture during Brain Awareness Week. And last year, we celebrated the 20 years of QBI. We're now 21, and we're just maturing. We're getting there. So the QBI is an institute in the University of Queensland, and everyone in the institute studies the brain. I mean, how many of you have thought about your brains? You know, it's the thing that runs your bodies. It makes you enjoy life, music, arts, good food, wine, why you love your children. Some of us maybe don't love our children nearly as much, but all the problems that come with it, that's all your brain in action. And really, you know, uh, we spend a third of our lives asleep. You know, many of us, you lie down at night, you lie down, you're out, get up in the mornings, off to work or whatever you're doing, and of course, some of us get transported to those very odd places, and some have terrible dreams. So what on earth is all that about? You know, why is it, do you really need to sleep? How many hours do you need to sleep? Is it any good for you? So tonight, Roly Sussex, who's the MC, has got a panel together to tell you about the kinds of things that we know about sleep and we're gonna do. Roly is uh, Emeritus Professor at the University of Queensland, Professor of Applied Language Studies, and I'm sure many of you have heard his dulcet tones on ABC telling you about words that we hear about. So look, welcome everyone, and uh, have a great evening. Roly. Thank you, Pankaj. <laughs> evening all. Uh, my name is Roly Sussex, and I'm an Emeritus Professor from the University of Queensland in Language Studies. And if you ask what a linguist is doing, uh, introducing experts about the brain, I can tell you that I weave beautiful words around interesting intellectual things, but the people you're going to be hearing this evening are experts on sleep. Now, one important uh, managing detail uh, in, involves the questions. Uh, you will see a QR code on the screen, and if you take out your camera, or rather your phone, point the camera app at the QR code, it will give you a little yellow band underneath which takes you to a, uh, a, a place called qr.sli.do. Slido is the name of the app. So point your camera to the QR code, get the sli.do, it'll take you to a, an app where you can write your question and it will automatically be uploaded. And we're not going to have a roving mic tonight. Uh, we will in fact see your questions down here on the screen in front of us and the panel will be able to address them directly. Go. You can put up your questions at any time. We will repeat the QR code if, so that if you suddenly are stricken with new ideas about questions, uh, you can jump in at any time. So let's get deep into sleep. Uh, sleep is something that all animals do. Some animals, like koalas, speak, sleep about 20 hours a day. Uh, giraffes and horses sleep about three. Uh, as Pankaj said, we spend about a third of our lives asleep. And over a total lifespan, that's about 27 years. We sleep a lot when we're babies, and we start sleeping more as we aged. A friend of mine in his 80s tells me that he has a scan every afternoon, which is not a medical procedure, but a senior citizen's afternoon nap. <laughs> People usually think of sleep as a single empty black period of not. During sleep, we don't work, we don't converse, we don't use social media, we don't eat or drink, we don't read or think or listen to symphonies, we don't care for our garden, and we don't even contribute to the birth rate. On the other hand, you missed that one. On the other hand, we chase sleep, but we also try to minimize it. We push it away with coffee or amphetamines, and we try to bring it on with sleeping tablets. We worry about having too much or too little of it. So the goal of today's event is to show that all of this is far too simple. Everyone knows, or should, that sleep is important. But sleep and the brain are part of a very complex and sophisticated plan. There are many different kinds of sleep functions happening behind our closed eyes. And sleep is absolutely fundamental to our continuing good health. Not having enough of it can have serious implications for your quality of life, your longevity, and your well-being and your ability to think and learn. One thing I have learnt from these colleagues is that the brain does its own garbage collection. 
you have to respect an organ that can do that. It's more than I can manage on my own anyway. So more specifically, sleep is very important socially. Sleep is crucial in early childhood development. There are different kinds of sleep, including REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep and slow wave sleep and other kinds in between. REM sleep and slow wave sleep are very different and both may influence how our waking brain works. Think about that for a moment. And finally, it may be possible to provoke sleep, uh, specific sleep functions by manipulating the brain. And we will get to that later too. This evening's event is the annual public lecture of the Queensland Brain Institute. And QBI presents cutting edge research in an area of urgent concern. And as we shall see, sleep is indeed urgent. This year's event is time to co coincide with two international milestones, Brain Awareness Week and World Sleep Day, which actually falls tomorrow. We start with an overview of the science of sleep. We are thinking beings in a society, so sleep has psychological and social dimensions. It centrally concerns the brain, so it is neurological and biological and physiological. It involves chemistry, so it's also biochemical. And it involves drugs, so it's pharmacological as well. Since sleep touches so many areas of our lives, we have four experts from different areas of the university. We need to start with some perspective of the big picture of sleep science, including how sleep has evolved. So here is Professor Bruno van Swinderen from QBI. Bruno, yours. All right, so um, the Romans thought that sleep was a kind of death and um, that it was simple. And I think we always knew, people always knew that sleep was not simple, right? So we know that our, our partners twitch when they sleep, babies smile sometimes when they sleep, horses can sleep standing up or sometimes lying down. Um, things happen during sleep that are interesting, that, that seem to signify that uh, there's some complex things happening behind there. But that complexity only became evident once uh, EEG was invented. So what is an EEG? You've all heard that, that, that acronym. It's uh, electrical recordings from the, the scalp in humans to measure electrical fields in the brain. And it's been 100 years of EEG, right? This was 100 years ago that this was invented by somebody called Hans Berger. Um, and the first thing that he observed was that when you close your eyes, you see alpha waves. These are 10 hertz oscillations. This was a, 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 an oscillation in the brain uh, that could be measured by EEG. And this, the EEG then really revealed the different stages of sleep, things that were hidden uh, behaviorally almost. So what's a, what does a typical night of sleep look like um, now that we kind of understand this better after 100 years of EEG? Uh, you fall asleep, you close your eyes, you see alpha waves. You pretty quickly go into deep sleep. Within the first 10 minutes, 20 minutes, you go into deep sleep, going through stage one and stage two of, of, of um, non-REM sleep, as it's called. And you can see then ripples and these sharp wave ripples and K-complexes and spindles. And these are little fast jitters of activity happening as you're approaching deep sleep. When you get to deep sleep, the brain displays delta activity. These are one hertz, one per second oscillations that traverse your cortex. And what's interesting about deep sleep is that the more sleep pressure you have, the bigger amplitude your delta oscillations are. Right? So if you're really tired or you know, there's a lot of sleep pressure or you haven't slept much, um, there's high amplitude delta. And that delta amplitude decreases throughout the night, almost as if it's achieving a function, that it needed to be really big at the beginning of the night. And by the time at the end of the night your sleep is finished, it's smaller. Um, and then the weird thing about sleep is that you alternate with REM sleep, with rapid eye movement sleep, every 90 minutes, pretty regularly. Um, where do these 90 minutes come from? They don't even begin during sleep. They begin actually during your waking life. We have what are called ultradian rhythms. So we have 90 minute rhythms of, of attentiveness and less attentiveness throughout the day, uh, where we become more attentive and then less attentive and more awake and less awake. And ideally, uh, when you fall asleep, when you go to bed, you should catch your ultradian rhythm on a, on a trough of, a, of, of lower arousal. And that'll be then continuing into your sleep cycle, alternating with your REM sleep. Now, what happens during REM? Uh, the brain kind of wants to 
you know, achieve deep sleep function, and we'll talk a bit about that later on, what those functions might be, uh, in the beginning of the night, first off, and put off REM for 90 minutes. And then um, when you go into rapid eye movement sleep, clearly there's rapid eye movement, but many other things happen. Your heart rate becomes irregular, your temperature drops, um, and you have vivid dreams, um, which is surprising for most, and why that would be necessary is, a, is really, you know, an interesting topic of discussion. And then you go back into another um, deep sleep stage with slow wave amplitudes, and then another REM sleep stage, and typically by the end of the night towards the morning, you're mostly in REM sleep with a lot of dreaming. Your dreams tend to be more emotionally laden at the beginning of the night. If I were to wake you up at the beginning in your first REM cycle, you would have often terrifying or very emotional dreams. Towards the morning, your dreams could be more mundane. Uh, you know, walking through mud, losing teeth, that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, which we've all had. Um, and that seems to imply a sort of REM sleep pressure as well. There's deep sleep pressure, high amplitude slow waves at the beginning of the night, you know, very emotional dream content at the beginning of the night. And it suggests that some functions are being satisfied um, by sleep. And what we're discovering now by looking at animal models is that REM sleep and deep sleep seem to have completely different functions. Uh, it's almost like the brain is trying to achieve two different things by these two different kinds of sleep. So what are these functions? Uh, we'll talk a bit about them later on as well. But we can now study this in animal models that don't necessarily have a cortex uh, where we can't necessarily measure an EEG, but we can measure other kinds of brain activity to know that they're in a, a deep sleep equivalent or a REM sleep equivalent. And deep sleep seems to be mainly about repair. That's what the brain wants to do first. It wants to repair itself. It wants to make sure that the cells are healthy, that the, that the rubbish has been taken out, that uh, stress is being dealt with, that, that broken proteins are being cleared away, that um, if I had to put it in one, in, in one phrase, that the brain is trying to overturn the second law of thermodynamics. It's trying to decrease entropy, right? Things get messy, and it's trying to unmessy things, and not really getting there, but really trying. Um, I just came back for a, from a conference on, on sleep function in the US. I just stepped off the plane, literally, <laughs> today. And I learned a very interesting thing, uh, one statistic that was surprising to me. And that there is a, a 0.9 correlation, so one, a correlation of one is a perfect straight line. There's a 0.9 correlation between your sleep EEG and your chronological age. So if I were to be able to see, to measure your EEG during sleep, I would be able to very, very accurately predict how old you're likely to be. And that says something interesting. It says some, there's a certain inevitability in a way of, uh, of how the EEG changes with age. Um, that relates to how sleep is changing with age as well, and how those sleep functions maybe then are also changing. And we'll talk a bit about that um, in the panel, um, especially with regards to, to what's different about childhood sleep, and why children, in a way, need a different kind of sleep and need a lot more REM sleep. Um, so that's, I think, a, a very interesting question then. Uh, if deep sleep is about repairing the brain, what is REM sleep for? Why, why do we need to dream every single night? Uh, maybe we'll get an answer to that question by the end of the panel. Uh, I have some ideas, but I think we'll talk a bit about childhood sleep first. Yep. Right, thank you, Bruno. Uh, this man, by the way, is profoundly sleep deprived at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a hero as well, so he's here with us. Right, now that you understand some of the complexities of sleep, let's jump into the research. The story which we will now tell you starts from the cradle. Babies sleep a lot. Any parent will tell you that they wish babies slept more, a lot more. But what is going on with the amount and quality of sleep in early childhood development? And how important is it for the life which follows? How might environment affect sleep? And what has that got to do with early childhood education and caring? To tell us what and how, let me introduce Professor Karen Thorpe from QBI. Karen. Thank you. So sleep is a developmental process and we've heard about that and it doesn't look the same across the lifespan. And one of the things that many people will know is that naps happen at the beginning of life and scans at the end of life. 
Um, so when you've got the, and, and it's a window into the brain. So when we've got young children, which is the area we focus on, it's when we've got a lot of developing brain. We've got a lot of activity going on in forming the brain architecture. And then when we've got the diminishing brain, we also need lots of naps. So what's happening there yeah, as, the, as, as across the lifespan? What's happening, as Bruno said, is we've got lots of changes in what the function of sleep is. Now, the work that we do focuses on the first five years of life. And there's an awful lot of change that happens there. Um, one of the things that we see is, and everyone who's had a baby will know that when they're very young, we have multiple sleep-wake cycles through the night. So their sleep is much more broken. It's shorter sleep cycles. They will wake for feeding, but that's a common pattern. So poly polyphasic sleep, multiple sleep-wake cycles throughout the 24-hour period. But there's a very universal pattern. Wherever you are in the world, it then goes down to one or two naps in the day, starting to get more um, focus into the night time. And then eventually, usually around the age of five, which is when children go off to school, most children will have ceased to nap. So between three and five, we see that go disappear. And we're asking, so what is that? What is, what is the meaning of naps? And what's going on? And the sleep will, and I think the function of a nap in the day looks different from nighttime. We also see that as the naps decrease, we see more length of night sleep. Of course, when they're teenagers, that all changes. So we're really interested in what's going on there. And we know there's more REM sleep, for example, as the child is processing all of those things that are happening in their day. It's a very rapid period of human development and of course the brain is the bit that's processing all those experiences and all those synapse formations are shaping what the child knows and remembers. But so we've got this universal process but of course children live in different environments and that's our interest. We're interested in what happens and how is the environment manipulating sleep and what happens. And of course when you're a parent one of the questions we often get asked is do you work to the baby's sleep pattern or should I control the sleep pattern and try to shape, shape it? Now, we're interested in that, but one of the places that we study is in the lab, a naturalistic lab of early childhood education and care. And it's a really important place because early childhood education and care, the first five years of life, is something that most Australian children and actually most children in the developed world encounter. In Australia, by the time a child enters school, 96% of children will have attended an early childhood education and care service. And some children who start from their first year of life will spend up to 10,000 hours in those settings. And of course, all of that is at the same time that they are developing sleep. What we know is that some of what happens in that work, and it's work from Sally Staten, who's an associate professor at QBI, that those patterns, the childcare patterns of sleep form, can actually also, they endure beyond the period. It's not just at the time, they're shaping sleep for the long term. So what happens in childcare and what are we interested in? Well, what happens in childcare is they try to make sure that all children sleep in the middle of the day. Um, it's about staffing, it's about, um, you know, the convenience of that, the routine. Um, but what we know is that on days when children don't go to childcare, they may not sleep in the same way. And this last slide that's associated with my pictures is of a, one child who goes to childcare on Monday, Wednesday and Friday. And their shift of sleep is... It, it is different in those days because childcare is forcing them to have their sleep at a different period of time or indeed to have a sleep when they wouldn't normally because they're made to lie down and some of those children go to sleep and some of them don't. Some of them don't go to sleep but it's stressful for them and what we know from our cortisol studies in the team is that cortisol is higher for children who would normally not nap but who have had to lie down so that affects their sleep and what we also know is the children whose sleep occurs in childcare at a different time 
enforces, it changes, much like jet lag that Bruno's experiencing, is what we would call social jet lag. And what we found is that you can change the, the sleep cycle of a child by almost up to four hours when they're made to sleep and then they're going to bed time between days in childcare and days that not. So we, and so it's a phenomenon like jet lag where we're making children shift their sleep patterns. Now the question is, what does that do? What does that do for children's learning? What does that do for children's ability to emotionally regulate? All things that a child is learning in those first five years of life. Wow. Okay. Cast your mind back to the times when you were sent to have a nap with everybody else at kindergarten. <laughs> I can remember that. All right. Um, so there you are, five years old. Uh, Karen's been watching you for five years and ready to launch into your education and then a little bit later into work as you become a social being. You know how important it is to take proper care of your sleep, but do you know how, how all that fits with social life? What are your privileges, duties, and rights in relation to sleep? Privileges, duties, and rights. Who is getting enough sleep? Who isn't? Why? And what are the emotional implications of sleep and non-sleep? That is the province of Professor Simon Smith from the Institute of Social Science Research in the Humanities and Social Sciences Faculty. Simon. Thank you, Rolly, and, and hello, everybody. I just want to acknowledge the Turrbal and Yagra people of Brisbane. It's such a, a beautiful city that we live in. We've, we've heard um, that sleep is important for <coughs> brain health, for metabolic health, for cardiac health, for lifelong learning. Sleep is also important uh, very critically for a whole range of other uh, functions that we require for everyday life. And those things include decision making and mood and social interaction. When you sleep well, you're a better you. You're calmer, you're more relaxed, you're more tolerant, uh, you're less likely to be, uh, to be irritable and frustrated. Apologies, everyone. Sleep, because of those reasons, sits right alongside diet and exercise as really the foundation for good health and particularly the foundation for overall well-being. Uh, we think it's the essential ingredient, actually, uh, in, in well-being and something that requires uh, probably a little bit more attention because of that. But if all those things are true, all those functions are kind of important, then it, it feels that everyone should be getting the best sleep that they possibly can. It turns out, though, that that's not the case. For many people, uh, getting good sleep is um, particularly difficult. And that uh, good sleep is not evenly distributed across the populations. There's some people who are sleeping well and some people kind of aren't. And there's something about that's patchy about a, a good sleep. And so that's something we uh, try and focus on about who's getting the sleep they need and who isn't. Because there's particular individuals, groups and places that aren't getting good sleep and perhaps aren't getting the support they need uh, to get good sleep. So who's missing out and why are they missing out and what are we doing about it? So who's missing out, first of all? Well, the World Health Organization and other groups are looking at this uh, very seriously. Although the data for sleep isn't quite as good as it is for other health um, concerns, we do know a few things. We know that for, uh, there's big gaps between um, good sleep and poor sleep, big gaps in sleep quality to do with financial status, to do with education, to do with culture, to do with gender, age, and geography. We've looked at the Australian data and found similar things, big differences sometimes, big gaps between the sleep haves and the sleep have nots. But why does it happen? What causes this? When we think about poor sleep, we often think about sleep disorders. Sleep disorders like insomnia and sleep apnea. Now, they're very common and they're very impactful. But there's other things going on in our homes and in our neighbourhoods that might be making sleep harder than it needs to be. Imagine a family where parents are working long hours or they're working strange shifts or they're uh, requiring long commutes to get to work. Their kids might be going to sleep late on some nights because of sport, might be getting up early on some mornings uh, to get to school. Some families, for lots of reasons, are kind of chaotic and maybe overcrowding. All those things make uh, getting good sleep more difficult. Imagine, too, if you're in a noisy neighbourhood near a major road or, or rail line, somewhere with too much street lighting shining into your house at night, poor air quality or a lack of parks and other green spaces for exercise 
and views. All those things make it harder to get good sleep. Imagine too if your suburb is very hot in summer or very cold in winter. You don't have air conditioning, uh, you don't have good heating. Or you live in a flood prone area and every time it rains you worry. Those things make it hard uh, to get to sleep. So you can see that sleep is something we don't just do by ourselves. Sleep is very connected to our families, to our housing, to our communities, to our, kind of, uh, to our culture, the whole social world and environment around us. So important decisions about how we support families, how we construct homes, how we design our kind of suburbs and cities, all of those things impact sleep. And we've got a chance on Saturday to vote, so when you can, uh, vote one for sleep. What are we doing about it? Well, in, in our group, um, we can't answer all those questions. They're, they're, they're too vast and too complex, but we're having a, a, a fair go. For people with insomnia and sleep apnea, we're designing new treatments, and, and some of those treatments include helping people stick to the treatments that they've got, and some of those methods are being taken up uh, right around the world. For people experiencing chronic pain and young people who've uh, undergone treatment for cancer, we're looking at the benefits of improving sleep early on for their lifelong uh, and lifespan outcomes. Young people are still at increased risk of uh, road crash and death from road crash. It's a major global killer. So we're looking at programs to help young people sleep better so they're less sleepy uh, during the day. We're doing similar things for university students, helping to improve their sleep, to reduce the stress associated with their, uh, their study programs. And in this work, we're using kind of today's technologies of wearables and social media to connect up with young people. For people working in the gig economy, uh, such as Uber drivers or in hospitality, uh, may have to work at all hours of the night or day, may have to fit that work in, a si in alongside uh, other work, may be stressed about the uh, unreliability of their work. So we're interested in finding out about the impacts of sleep and better sleep on mental health, uh, family life and financial wellbeing. Again, thousands of people experience stress and hardship after the floods in Brisbane and in the Northern Rivers. We're looking to understand the impacts uh, of those stresses on sleep and thinking about ways to scaffold those communities so they can uh, get better sleep in more secure sleep environments. Uh, and if you want it, you can Google Let's Yarn About Sleep. That's a, a, a program, you can do it now, I don't mind, uh, with, your t with your phones, to read about an amazing program uh, run by Professor Fatima Yakut at UQ uh, up in Mount Isa, which is training sleep coaches to work with young people up there to improve their sleep, uh, to improve their education, their connection, and hopefully lifelong, uh, lifelong outcomes. While you're on your phones, uh, another important issue right now is how we might live in the future, how we might sleep in the future, and the role of digital technologies uh, in our sleep. We're very concerned, as, as many of you might be, around the impact of uh, digital life on children and particularly their sleep. There are lots of links now between screen time and poor sleep, between screen time and well-being. One feature of screens is that they emit light, and light is very important for sleep. Light is one of the signals that controls when we go to sleep and when we wake up. So if we put the wrong inputs in, we're going to get the wrong outputs. So we're working right now uh, with young children, looking at their uh, sleep lives, their activity, uh, and their daily lives and the light exposure, using wearables and wearing other devices and technologies to understand exactly whether uh, light is the problem or something else about digital technologies uh, is the problem. All the programs uh, that we're devising are designed to be really practical. We're really looking at ways uh, to make things useful so people can take them up in their communities. And we can already see lots of applications for some of the uh, programs we've designed to be rolled out in other places uh, across Queensland and Australia. So you can see that when we think about sleep in these ways, we need to think about ourselves uh, and our own brains. But we also need to think about transport infrastructure, industrial relations, you know, policing, schooling, global technology platforms climate change modelling and housing. And you can also say that when we think about sleep, we need to think about our choices around technology, our choices about where we live and how we live, and what kind of future we want to build around ourselves. We think uh, sleep is a fundamental right. Uh, we know that better sleep will improve many aspects of, uh, of life right across the life course. We think it's only fair that everyone should get the sleep uh, that they need and should benefit from it. Everyone deserves a good night's sleep and everyone should have somewhere safe and secure to sleep at night. Brilliant. Thank you. So that's a social dimension. Uh, it's not just a matter of going to bed, putting your head down, waiting for sleep to happen. All of these other things are impinging on it. Behind 
Simon's social version of you lies your brain. It weighs in at about 1.4 kilograms, give or take, and is the most complicated organ in your body. The brain is what puts human into humankind. One way it does so is by being conscious of itself and of things around it, and by having thoughts, but not so fast. Humans can't do that when under a general anesthetic. But what about sleep? Are you conscious when you sleep? You have two kinds of sleep, deep sleep and REM sleep and dreams. And, and how would we know what's going on in our heads during sleep? How are dreams part of your healthy sleep regimen? And here's a powerful idea. Might REM, rapid eye movement sleep, make you a more attentive person when you're awake and thereby promote better learning? To explore these mysteries, here again is Professor Bruno van Swindren from QBI. That's right, I love this topic. <laughs> um, I would venture to say that REM sleep, uh, and a hypothesis is that REM sleep is what keeps us conscious. So um, there's a lot of REM in developing infants, and that builds consciousness in a way, that builds their consciousness. And maybe one idea is that the continuing REM in adulthood is what's keeping us conscious. And if we did not have REM, we would literally be zombies, we would be automatons, um, which we feel like sometimes when we had a, a bad night's sleep, right? Um, so there's, a, there's some issues here to talk about. Um, typically what's been associated with REM, and I think you mentioned it, is a emotional regulation. That we have REM sleep to optimize, to regulate our emotions. Uh, also potentially motor learning, that's why we twitch, that's a way for the brain to learn how to control its muscles and what part of our body belongs to us. But there's something about emotional regulation that always bothered me. So many animals have REM-like sleep. And what's, what's interesting about REM is that the brain is essentially awake, right? So if you measure brain activity during REM, it looks like wakefulness. It doesn't look any different than a waking brain with a little bit of theta activity, seven to 10 hertz activity that has a special function uh, related to, to prediction. I can, we'll talk about that. So the brain looks awake, and that's the, the definition of REM. It's not the rapid eye movement. Many animals don't have eyes that move rapidly, <laughs> right? So flies don't, the animal that I work with. But flies have active sleep. They have a sleep stage. If you put an electrode into their brain, <clears throat> and you can see that they're disconnected from the outside world, that they're sleeping, they have an increased arousal threshold, decreased behavioral responsiveness, but their brain's awake. This has been shown now in, in flies, it's been shown in octopus, it's been shown in spiders, in bees, and the possibility here is that most animals have a kind of REM sleep, have an active sleep. Now let's go back to think about emotional regulation. It just doesn't make sense. Why does a fly need emotional regulation? <laughs> right? Um, it doesn't seem to make sense. It's, it's gotta be something else than emotion. And let's think about what emotions are for. Why do we have emotions? Uh, we have emotions because they tell us when we make a mistake, right? So emotions are there to, to, to kind of ramp up our brain to change something when we made a prediction that did not work out, that did not get borne out, when we have a prediction error, as it's called, right? So a, a typical prediction error is a joke. If I tell you a joke right now, it's funny because typically at the end, there's a twist. There's something you don't expect and suddenly it's funny and that's why it's funny. Because there's something that you did not expect. That, that's the basis of humor. That's the basis of a joke. And that's why jokes are not funny the second time, right? So, <laughs> because you know, you know the twist. Uh, and what that really says then is that emotions are there to tell us that we've made a mistake. That's why we get angry. That's why we get surprised. Um, that's why we think something is funny, uh, because we are constantly making predictions about the world. The brain is basically a prediction machine that every step of the way, every 100 milliseconds of the way, for a fly or for a human, it's predicting the future. And sometimes those models that it's predicting are true and work out, and then you move on. Uh, and sometimes you make a mistake, and then you get emotional. You detect the mistake and you fix the mistake. Your brain fixes the model so that you don't make that mistake in the future. And the brain is constantly trying to become a better prediction machine. So if that's how the brain works, now think about how that relates to consciousness. If you were a perfect prediction machine, making perfect predictions about the world, 
you would not need to be conscious because you're making, you're generalizing perfectly about the world. Every prediction would be perfectly borne out. Could it be that we go into a virtual reality every night, that flies go to a virtual reality every night to make sure that we don't overpredict, that we don't predict too much so that we're basically not detecting change when it happens because we have to detect change to learn or that we're not predicting too little so that we're constantly jittery about every single change that happens to keep us in that middle ground of adaptability, of detecting just the right amount of change to be able to learn. Right? And that potentially is what consciousness is, the constant detection of changes, uh, the constant detection of prediction errors that you're making in life. Right? That you're going through the world making predictions and the world is never entirely predictable. And you're always getting it a little bit wrong. And that always getting it a little bit wrong is what keeps us conscious. If you were getting it right all the time, you would be a zombie. And I feel like this is a very philosophically and sociologically interesting thought, that making mistakes is a good thing. We need to keep on making mistakes, and that may be dreaming by somehow putting us into this virtual reality and trying out all these different things in this kind of crazy world is exactly the, the thing our brain needs to, to keep us in that zone of, a, of a adaptive mistake making. This is one hypothesis of REM sleep that I think is extremely exciting to test. And the beauty about it is that it's testable in animal models. We don't need to talk about consciousness in a fly. We don't need to talk about emotion in a fly. We need to record from their brain and detect when they make mistakes. And we can do that. We can record what's called a prediction error signal. We record from their brain, and whenever they make predictions and that prediction did not get borne out, there's a blip in their brain. And they're, they're trying to keep that blip the right size. I think this is a very kind of beautiful, testable potential theory of REM sleep, and this is something that's a discussion now in the field. And it, it moves us away from emotional regulation to thinking more clearly about what brains do, which is trying to make predictions and trying to optimize predictions, which is something that we all have to do every day. And what children, when they're developing, are learning to do about the world. How, how do they make predictions in this world that they've never seen before. They need to, to make new models and, and, and anticipate what happens next and understand that some things belong with each other and some things don't. But not get to a point where, where they're never learning something new. And I think that's the function of REM sleep. At least it's a testable idea. And it makes a lot of sense to me in terms of uh, trying to place it in the, in, the, in the evolutionary tree that you see on the screen. Um, that it evolved later. There's quiet sleep functions, deep sleep functions that are about repair, and then there's active sleep functions that are about, about prediction. I think those are the two, the two kind of functions that are worth uh, investigating to try to understand um, why we sleep and why it alternates. Wow. Mm. I, I dream in five languages. Uh, the notion that I'm going into a VR state, which is about prediction, gives me I should have to think about that. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Bruno. So anyway, there you are sitting with your 1.4 kilogram of brain firing away, a pre-made product straight from the shelf of the genetic supermarket. Right? Wrong. One of the astounding aspects of your brain is that some parts of it are plastic and can be persuaded to take on other roles and functions, some of which are part of our sleep story. Is it possible to replicate sleep and artificially flick the sleep switch in our brains to promote deep sleep functions? Is it possible for such interventions to offset the effect of sleep deprivation, flush out toxins, and potentially prevent the development of Alzheimer's? Here is Associate Professor Martin Sale from the Faculty of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. Thank you, Rolly, um, and hello, everyone. Great to see so many people here this evening um, learning more about sleep. So you've heard um, already this evening what sleep is, the different stages of sleep, the importance that sleep has in promoting um, optimal brain function, uh, things like removing toxins from the brain, and how sleep changes throughout our lifetime. But I'm sure everyone here has experienced at least one night where they haven't had a good night's sleep. And when you wake up in the morning from that poor night's sleep, you feel rubbish. You've got um, impaired decision-making, 
your attention is impaired, um, and generally speaking, you're uh, feeling like you need to go back to sleep because your brain's not functioning well. Now, those issues associated with a poor night's sleep are exacerbated if um, you have a lifetime of poor sleep. Now, that might occur because um, of a certain medical condition like obstructive sleep, sleep apnea, or it might be because you have a career which re requires you to undertake a whole lot of um, shift work. Now, so those, those um, issues in terms of um, sleep deprivation get exacerbated over that lifetime. And there's been some really interesting research to show that um, a career and a lifetime of shift work can actually reduce life expectancy by up to a decade, highlighting that impaired sleep over a long period of time has dramatic impacts on our brain health. So what can we do about it? Well, currently there are medications available to offset the effects of sleep deprivation and to make us work to some degree um, relatively well um, during the next day. And basically speaking, those medications form into the class of stimulants, whether that be caffeine or um, other forms of um, amphetamines. Now, as with any uh, medication, there are side effects associated with those medications. They can be things like an increase in tremor, an increase in anxiety, an increase in heart rate. There could be even uh, issues associated with dependency, not to mention the fact that often those um, stimulants are used illegally. Are there other options that we have to offset the effects of sleep deprivation to allow us to function relatively normally after a, a period of poor sleep. So the research that I'm doing is looking at an alternate approach to offsetting the effects of sleep deprivation, not with medication, but with electrical brain stimulation. And what we're trying to do here is to use electrical stimulation, which we call transcranial alternating current stimulation, to pass a weak electrical current between two electrodes that we place on the brain at a frequency that mimics slow wave sleep. And you heard earlier that slow wave sleep is characterised by these high amplitude, low frequency oscillations in brain excitability. And we can mimic those oscillations with this electrical brain stimulation. What's neat about it is that it's safe, it's painless. Indeed, most people that receive it are unable to perceive the fact that they're getting their brain stimulated. It's also cheap and it's portable. So these devices um, are amenable to being used in a home or a work environment. And the work that we're doing is trying to establish whether this form of brain stimulation, which we apply for about 20 to 30 minutes, which basically mimics a brief nap and which we know is a very effective way at offsetting uh, sleep deprivation. Can we get similar benefits to a nap by stimulating the brain in a way that essentially tricks the brain into thinking that it's asleep. Now we stimulate the brain when the participant is awake and that um, allows us to be able to use the uh, intervention in a fairly flexible way. There are other people using it uh, to stimulate the brain when people are in uh, non-REM sleep already, but this has got a couple of practical limitations. One is that obviously they need to be sleeping, so it limits the, the, I guess, the flexibility of when we can apply the stimulation. But we also need to be very careful that we're timing the um, applied electrical stimulation to very closely align with the endogenous natural sleep rhythms. If we get the, those two out of sync, it can actually um, knock out or abolish the effects of the natural sleep state. So we're using this intervention to try to uh, promote cognitive and motor function in people that are sleep deprived. Now, when I talk about my research in community discussions like this, um, I often get parents asking me, could I use this type of an approach to help my, my um, young child or children to better learn some of the concepts that they're learning in school? And it sounds amazing, and part of me goes, yeah, let's give it a crack. But um, I would strongly caution against that for a couple of, of reasons. One is that 
we need to be very sure that we're stimulating the right part of the brain and, and we spend a lot of time localising the part of the brain that we're trying to stimulate. Um, and home use, there's a risk that you'll inadvertently stimulate the wrong part of the brain and there might be some unwanted effects from that. The other thing is that we know that the adolescent brain is incredibly plastic. It's learning new things and its structure and function is changing very, very rapidly. And we still don't know the longer term effects of applying this form of brain stimulation in the adolescent brain. So my advice to parents thinking about ways to boost their child's performance at school is to focus more on uh, trying to improve their child's sleep health. So avoiding screen time before they go to bed and making sure that they're trying to go to bed at regular times. Um, I think that this form of brain stimulation will have a place, um, but that's, there's, there's still quite a few things that we need to work on before it becomes commonly used. The other thing that we're really excited about, and we're about to start some research on this, is to see whether uh, this form of brain stimulation does have a role to play in the garbage disposal that um, Rolly talked about early on. We know that slow wave sleep has a really important role to play in removing all the toxins that build up throughout the day. And over a period of time, if people aren't getting a good night's sleep, we know that they're at higher risk of developing dementias because the, the toxins have slowly built up over time. So we're currently about to start um, some research to see whether this form of brain stimulation can indeed help to drive that, that flushing mechanism within the brain to remove some of those toxins. And hopefully down the track it might be another approach to potentially delaying or offsetting the development of dementia. So back to you, Rolly. <laughs> Thank you. So sleep is not a matter of kind of switching things off for a third of the day. But in fact, during certain parts of sleep, your brain is in fact effectively awake and doing things which we would otherwise associate with, with ordinary awake activities. So that's our story from cradle to social rights to REM sleep to dreams to plasticity. Uh, this is a, a most extraordinarily important and urgent area and you can see why. We'd like to start uh, addressing some of the questions that you've been putting to us now, and I'd ask the, the panel uh, who would like to jump in and look at any of the questions which uh, ha we are, have on the screen in front of us. Let's start with the top one, which is, which is more important, the amount or the quality of sleep? Which of the panel would like to have a crack at that? Bruno. This was actually an important topic at the, at the conference. So is it more important to have, if you have the same amount of sleep every night and it's short, um, is, that, is it better to just have regular sleep or longer sleep? Uh, and the, the answer is that it's, it's better to have regular sleep. Right? So there's something called the sleep regularity index that can be calculated. And what, how they calculate it basically is um, they look at your sleep every night and they kind of layer all those, those bars of how much sleep you get over each other. And the more they overlap with each other, the higher your index. If they overlap perfectly, you get a, an index of 100. And most of us sit at around 80, a median of 80, in terms of our sleep regularity index. And it turns out that this is a very good predictor, the sleep regularity index rather than sleep duration. The sleep regularity index is an extremely good predictor, not only of, uh, of um, mental health issues, if you don't uh, have regular sleep, uh, but also, uh, unfortunately, of mortality. Um, and I think this was mentioned as well by one of our panelists. Um, so it's, it's very important to have regular sleep, even if, if, the short, if the sleep is shorter, if it's just five hours, if it's regular five hours, that actually is, is, is better quality sleep than, um, than nine hours one day, four hours another day, and that kind of thing. Um, so that, that was revealing to me in terms of like a, a very clear correlation with, uh, with mm. uh, effects if you don't, if you don't have that. Um, so regularity is extremely important. And then uh, that ties to what uh, uh, Simon Smith was talking about, that um, um, what makes you have regular sleep? There's other aspects in your life that need to be regular as well, right? So when do you exercise? When do you eat, right? If those are regular, then it's more likely that you will also have regular sleep, right? But if everything else is disordered, then you might have disordered and irregular sleep. So um, there are many things that have to come together to have, a, to have regular sleep. 
Bear in mind then the sleep regularity index. It's an important concept. It was uh, an Australian study. Mm, all right. Yeah. We had a question here a moment ago. Can I die from lack of sleep? You can die from lack of sleep. You can? These experiments have been done uh, in rats, in many animals, even in flies. Mm. And uh, I think rats will die after 17 days of, a, of, a, of lack of sleep. Flies about two weeks. Um, I think in, in humans, it's been, you know, sadly done in some other contexts. But yes, you will die from lack of sleep. You will die from lack of sleep before you die from lack of food. Can I yeah, just in mind as well, yeah. Can I just add, the, add to that, Rolly, that, that you often think about how long can we go without sleep before we die. But in fact, people die from lack of sleep all the time in road crash and industrial accidents. How much alcohol can I drink and still get REM sleep? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to tread in a very, very difficult Not pond? Not many birth to fives drink alcohol, so I'll <laughs> stay out of that one. I don't think we can make any uh, clear recommendations that you can take home with you. So one of the problems with drinking alcohol is, um, well, twofold. One, one is we often think it helps us get to sleep and it feels like it does because it's a sedative but it puts you into a, a state of light sleep that's not very um, satisfying on the whole and you tend to wake up quite a lot through the night. The problem with REM is that you're already very relaxed so your major muscles uh, are very relaxed and if you're sleeping on your back uh, your upper airway muscles are even more relaxed and alcohol adds to that so people might have noticed even a small amount of alcohol can lead to increased uh, snoring and for people with obstructive sleep apnea uh, it can make that picture very much worse. So there's kind of no amount we can recommend. Go and talk to your GP very mm. carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't I remember my dreams? Anyone? I'll have a, I'll have a crack as someone who can't remember their dreams. Um, I, I tend not to. Um, one, one reason we think is that vivid dreams are kind of narrative dreams. Um, that uh, Bruno was talking about tend to occur more often in REM sleep. You have dreams mm. in other stages, of sleep, but the kind of the great stories, the monsters after you, all that kind of stuff, tends to be in REM. And in REM sleep, you are more likely to wake up than other stages of sleep during the night, but not necessarily. So if you sleep through a REM episode, you tend not to remember the dream in the morning. Something's happened, some cycle has been completed. So it's more the case that if you wake up during a REM episode, you'll remember the dream, the dream that you just had. If you don't wake up during REM, you tend not to re remember your dreams. Lovely. Karen, this is, I think, related to your work as well. Um, do we, why do we wake up naturally? I, mean, I was thinking about your children. Mm. Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer that. Simon might be better for that. But one of the things that often gets asked is, should we wake children up? Should we regulate their sleep for them to fit? Actually, our, our, our timetable, as we see happening in early childhood education and care settings, or should we allow children to sleep the cycles that they need to sleep? Mm -hmm. What we do know is that if we wake children at certain stages, we see things that, like their inability to control their emotions. If they're in a childcare setting, we might see more conflict between the small toddlers that we're, we're working with. But... I don't know um, about the waking, and we get asked that a lot. Um, my, my view on this is this. Um, I mentioned light as an input to the biological clock, and the biological clock is really important for the timing of sleep and wake. And it's why dysregularity or the, the regularity index that Bruno mentioned becomes important, and it's why shift work is very um, uncomfortable and harmful and bad for your health. It's the moving the clock timing back and forth. We see it when we change time zones. We see it when we change the clocks in every other state um, for daylight savings. In a perfect world, two things kind of regulate your sleep. One is how much sleep you need, how much wake you build up during the day. The other is the clock, the clock timing. So again, in the perfect world, you would fall asleep when you need to at night when you feel sleepy and you'd wake up when you've had enough sleep uh, ready for the day. And when you're very regular, that's what tends to happen. If you get a nice uh, early, early to bed, early to rise kind of lifestyle, then you'll tend to wake up naturally, uh, feeling quite refreshed and ready to go. 
when you start to fiddle with it by going to bed too late or, or changing your work times or your sleep times, it starts to become uncomfortable, you start to get out of whack, you start to lose that ability to wake up spontaneously. Mm. I'm just wondering what happens in a place like uh, Finland, where in winter you have 21 hours of dark and three hours of light, and in summer you have 21 hours of light and three hours of dark. Does the, do they have a, a, a rhythm which is adaptable to climatic conditions like that? So our, our rhythms seem to be adaptable to climatic conditions. It's best done by penguins rather than people in Finland in terms of changing radically your sleep times and your wake times uh, during the year. But a lot of those countries also have big challenges such as seasonal affective disorder, SAD, so mm. this sort of winter depression. And what can happen is people start to get out of sync with the day and getting out of sync with each other, which becomes very uh, uncomfortable and, and uh, an increased safety risk. So what they look for in those environments is adding light where they can to improve, to artificially increase the day and doing other activities, so regularity around work times and meal times and activity mm -hmm. that help keep your clock set and synchronised. But if regularity is the name of the game, live on the equator. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, this one, one might interest you. Are wearables like Garmin's and Apple Watches actually effective at tracking our sleep? Can we rely on the heart rate values they use to track our sleep? Look, I, I don't know too much about the technology within uh, these devices. I, I know it's a bit of a, a black box in terms of the, um, the algorithms that they use. They do seem to align reasonably well to what um, sleep stages we are at, or at least when we fall asleep and when we wake up. Um, but essentially the gold standard for um, assessing the stages of the sleep, the duration of the sleep, the quality of our sleep, can only really be obtained from an, an EEG sleep study. Um, so I think they're, they're okay, but I would certainly not use them to read too much into uh, the amount of sleep you're getting, the quality of the sleep, and, and certainly in terms of the different stages of the sleep. So there's, there's good bits and bad bits about them. I think time is starting to run out on us, so <coughs> we'll see if we can <clears throat> wind this up a bit. So sleep is not an escape at the end of a long day. It's a crucial part of the healthy you. We've discovered some remarkable things about sleep today through the lifespan in its social role in the conscious neurological brain and being made plastic. Thank you for joining us tonight for a marvellous evening. Our thanks to QBI for organising it and to our presenters, Karen, Simon, Bruno and Martin, for fascinating and informing us. And also to the... Uh, Petunia Platoon in pyjamas, <laughs> who made everything happen in order, on time, with admirable regularity. And to that we have to add Angus, who's not a Petunia, but is taking pictures. Thank you, Angus. <laughs> if you would like to connect to QBI's ongoing work, uh, bookmark the QBI's website. Um, it's uh, available there. And especially the URL of their journal called The Brain which is designed for a discerning and informed public like you. Um, the, you've got a copy of the latest issue of The Brain in your show bag, together with some ingenious, indigenous Australian tea with sleep-promoting properties. And if you want a different contemporary insight into sleep, have a look at Dr. Michael Mosley's series, Australia's Sleep Revolution, which is running on SBS television at the moment, and you can see it on On Demand. This evening, we've shown you some of the very best of the latest insights into sleep, but this is just the first lap of a long voyage of exploration, and QBI is in it for the long haul. That's why your interest and support are so important. I'd like to end with a marvellously appropriate quotation from Thomas Decker, a 17th century English dramatist who said it so well 400 years ago, sleep is the golden chain that binds health and our bodies together. And he wasn't even a speech, sorry, a, a, a sleep specialist. Sleep is a golden chain that binds health and our bodies together. Here, to close the evening, is our host for tonight, Professor Pankaj Sa, Executive Director of QBI. Thanks very much, Rory. Look, uh, what a wonderful evening. And, you know, I'm sure for many of you, it's raised more questions than answers. Sleep is an amazing state. You know, we all, some of us love it, and some of us maybe not nearly so much, but I'm sure it's giving you thoughts on how to improve your sleep and your children's sleep. So look, join me in thanking the panel for a wonderful evening.
and join us for some refreshments outside. I look forward to seeing you at QBI.